Welcome, fitness enthusiasts and ultimate frisbee aficionados, to the Tobu Fitness Podcast. Your guide to elevating your game and mastering the art of ultimate frisbee through the lens of strength and conditioning. Whether you're a seasoned player or just stepping onto the field for the first time, this podcast is your one stop destination for unlocking your true potential. This is the Tobu Fitness Podcast with your host, certified strength and conditioning coach, Justin Shelby. Real quick, before we start the episode, it would mean the world to me if you could help share this information with as many Ultimate players as possible so we can help as many Ultimate players as possible. So if you have teammates, friends, family that are into Ultimate that you could share this episode with, that would help me out a lot. Let's get into the episode. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Tobu Fitness Podcast. This is episode number 15. We're out here. Uh, You can't really see it from the backdrop here, but we're at uh, Zilker Park here in Austin, Texas. Got a great guest today. Uh, This is Tim, but most people know him as Ulti Breakdowns on Instagram, providing a lot of highlights and, yeah, just film breakdowns. Tim, how are you? Hey, pretty good. Yeah, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Glad we could get this set up. Yeah, it's freaking beautiful out here. Yeah, this is, like I I told you earlier, this is the most unique podcast I've ever done. Um, Yeah, it's cool to just be outdoors, see a bunch of people just (laughs) walking about, but yeah, this guy over here playing the guitar. Yeah. Piqued my interest. Yeah. Yeah. That's Austin for you. Um, yeah. Do you want to tell people a little bit about yourself? Uh, yeah. Uh, so I've been playing, I guess, for about 15 years now. Uh, I started in high school, uh, my junior year, and I guess you could call it ultimate. Um, you know, it was like we, we knew enough to have seven people out in the field, um, but it was, you know, we didn't have any strategy. We didn't do stacks or anything. Uh, we knew how to throw flicks. That was, uh, I think, that was our competitive advantage. And we had like one, one or two tournaments that that we played, um, but it wasn't, you know, it was like typical, like church church group ultimate, you know. But started playing, I guess, real ultimate at University of Tennessee in Chattanooga, uh, go Swamp Donkeys, and that was in 2011. Uh, was when I started started there. Um, and that was like back in 2011, like we, we, we would take like 10 guys to tournaments. Like, so we'd have, uh, and I was, so I was not in a, in good shape. Uh, there's actually a, a swamp, they, they call it the swamp donk, swamp dock. And, um, where they talking, you know, kind of like, um, a, a guy on the team, like putting together a documentary about the, the growth of the team and kind of where it's, where it's going. Um, and one of the things in there that uh, someone says, Player Pierce, who actually played for Chain and Hustle, I think he played for Flyers one year, uh, said, you know, yeah, Tim was not the most in shape person, but he worked hard at it. So I think that was um, kind of like my um, MO for playing Ultimate was I just kind of got out there and I, I, I wanted to be the best at it. I wanted to be like, I wanted to beat you. Like, I didn't care who you were. I wanted to be better than you and beat you. Um, as a youngin, now I just I know I don't got that anymore. But played for four years. By the time I left, I captained two years, and uh, we made it to region. So we weren't a regionals competitive team, although we had some incredible players. We probably should have gone to regionals those years because we had just amazing players, players who played like Chain in the future and um, played Nashville Nightwatch. But we just we didn't have numbers, we didn't have depth, so we never kind of made it to regionals. And then. My senior year, I think it was, we made it to regionals for the first time and have been on a streak of regionals ever since. So the team has made it to regionals every year since that year. Um, and it's like something I take like pride in. So, you know, starting that off as a captain that first year. Yeah, so, but it was a bummer because I, I blew my ankle out. The third point against Tulane, I can't remember if that was the year Tulane went to nationals, but we were, we were up on serve. I blew my ankle out and we ended up losing that game by like three or four. Uh, so it was kind of a big bummer. After that, I played mix for a while with a team called Nuga by Nature. Uh, same thing, like regionally competitive, never quite made it to nationals. One or two games to go, um, which was heartbreaking. I played uh, Nashville Nightwatch for two or three seasons. I guess you can call it playing Nashville Nightwatch. I played like three points total. But my claim to fame is I have, regardless of um, throws or amount of points played, uh, the highest 
completion percentage and assist percentage of any AUDL player in history. I have one throw and one assist, and it's about 40 yards. So I probably have like highest like throw, like yards per throw. You gotta uh, get a plaque or something. Yeah, I, yeah. But um, so I played that for a few years, um, mostly a practice player, and then I played Huntsville Freaks for a few years um, and got to play with some amazing players there. So Brett Holtzmeyer was on the team uh, when I was playing. Eli, Elijah Jaime was on the team when I was playing. And those I think were probably like the two biggest guys that came out of that team. And a lot of really talented and incredible players who were in the start of their career at that point in time, like 2015, 2016, 2017. Yeah, I played that for a few years. Same thing, a few games to go. Couldn't like ever break through. Um, but then I moved to Ohio and played up in the Dayton area for a while with a team called Thunderpants the Magic Dragon. A uh, mixed team, had a lot of knee injuries, um, and so couldn't really like devote the time and energy that I wanted to to like be at the level uh, that I wanted to be at. Um, so kind of like took a step back and I've been playing like mostly like mid-level um, and then like a lot of leagues. And But I'm not that kind of person. Like I want to be, like I want to be the person that goes on the field and I want to I want to win every single time like it's not all about winning but like I love winning and I don't like losing uh so it's hard for me to be like a player on like teams that are like really necessary like developmental teams like people who are learning the game and are out there just to love playing the sport so I've transitioned now to coaching more uh, so I've had a few experiences coaching high school teams um I did a little bit of uh help at University of Dayton for a semester while I was up there, but then actually right after we moved back down to Tennessee. Um, and now I'll be helping out with Tennessee um, this coming year, helping on their coaching staff and hope to do hope to do big things. Nice. Yeah, that's all awesome. And talk to me about Ulti Breakdowns and what led you to want to start that? Yeah, it was kind of, because um, we were talking about this bit a, a second ago, it's kind of like a, a, an idea that I had. We talked as like a coaching group for Tanasi, and um, we were talking about okay, one of our problems is we're we're not a centralized team. We don't have like a city that uh, like all our players are kind of coalesce around. Um, we kind of pull from from Knoxville and from Chattanooga and from Nashville in those areas. Um, and so we were talking like, oh, we got to have a way to get guys on the same page. And so I knew enough about kind of like video recording on computers and, and stuff like that. I've used, I've used OBS in the past and was like, well, I got to, you know, let me see what I can do with this um, and just kind of put it up on Instagram uh, under the name Multi Breakdowns, which comes from something that I did with a few guys back in 2016. We uh, we had a Twitch channel called Multi Breakdowns and we, it, was, it was like a live discussion that we would have on games. We had like four, I think we did like four episodes of it. Um, and it was good. Uh, so kind of Tony Kane was one of the guys who did that, who played for Alley Cats. Um, I'm not going to put his, uh, all this out there, but there's a stat about Tony Kane that the deepest of people of, of knowledge on the AUDL will know. I'll just say it. He, uh, he's, I think he is the first technical in AUDL history. Wow. Uh, yeah. For first, if you can go back and watch it, he shouldn't have gotten a technical. It's like a spike and he like looks at the guy. It looks on the camera like he spikes it right on him. But he's like a good five or ten yards back. So it was undeserved, I think. But he's the first technical. Oh, he's on the alley catch. I think it was Kentucky at that point in time. Maybe the Bluegrass Revolution. Who am I? Anyways, history forgets me. But um, so we, I kind of just like used that name because we already had it. I, it was like already there and no one else was using it. And I put it out and then people started uh, like liking the videos. I didn't think anything of it. I, didn't, I was just trying to like figure out how to do this. Um, and... It seemed like it was like a lot of people were finding what I was saying helpful. And I'm not the most knowledgeable person. And, you know, people have like really in-depth videos and, and stuff. So I just, you know, started talking about and talking over highlights about things I saw and things that like piqued my interest on these videos. Um, and see, people seemed to find value in them. So I've just kind of like kept doing it and tried like done it on YouTube with film and yeah, just hoping people, new players especially, like get value and people can find it and like learn those things that are people don't talk about often because for experienced players it's kind of like second nature you know so trying to get that stuff out there to, to talk to folks yeah absolutely and that, i think that's the most admirable thing right it's like there's um there's a lot of like great minds in ultimate but i feel like there's not a lot of content that isn't behind a paywall 
out there. Um, so yeah, I think it's really awesome. You're just putting out like free stuff, uh, free game, as some people call it, out there. What are what are some of the biggest questions you're getting then from some of your like film breakdowns? Is is there like a common theme that you're noticing that people aren't quite maybe not understanding, but like you know people question the, most often? Yeah. So right now there's like a thread of people saying like, oh, I'm not focusing on like what like defense can do better. Like I, I focus a lot on offense. Uh, Mostly because like I'm an offensive-minded player. I played actually mostly defense in my career as a, as a player, but like my mind goes to offense. Like as I'm watching as I'm watching film, um, so there's a lot of people who are like, oh, like you're not talking about uh, you know what this defender can do better or like how this defender made the play. Well, one like I'm using like remixing things on Instagram is like kind of how I've been going about it. I need to figure out a better strategy, but. No one's really posting a lot of that kind of uh, stuff. No one's posting the low lights, kind of how I call them. So there's a little bit of that. And but what I'm really, really hoping to do is kind of like focus on positive outcomes and like like looking at the things that people are doing that contribute to them being successful on the field. Not necessarily, oh, this defender can kind of move this way and take this shot away, or you know, they need to like think about the the mark this way. I mean, we can spend all day breaking down those little things, and I think people do. Um, and we should do that like with players and talk about that, but that's like a very personal experience. Giving, giving feedback in that way needs to be personal. Um, so I, I try to focus on like, you know, this person doesn't know me. What I need to talk about them with is what they're doing well, because they're not asking for my negative criticism. So that's kind of like one of the things that I've, I've gotten like feedback on recently. A lot of guys have reached out, um, like younger players, players who are um, like captaining um, like smaller teams, like who may not be at like a nationals or regional trying to break the break through to nationals level that I've just like asked about, like, oh, how might I get my players? We have five solid guys on the team, but we have, but we have like a team of 14 guys. So, you know, nine of them are uh, kind of building their skills. Like how do we, how do we do things to, um, get those like win games you know build build skill win games be competitive but also like with that in mind um you know thinking about well what is what does it look like to kind of put those guys in areas to be successful how might you structure your offense to be a a model of efficiency and success without like putting players on the field and ignoring them it's kind of like some of the stuff I've gotten before. Yeah, no, I think that's that's good, like, reflection on everything. It sounds like, like, with that feedback, you'll also be able to kind of, like, grow and offer more. But I definitely, like, empathize with what you're saying. A lot of times players, like, unknowing to them get their highlights posted. So they don't want some random person just to come along and be like, oh, you could have done this, this, this better. It's like, I didn't ask for that. And, like, that's why, yeah, I do the same thing with, like, I'm not going to break down a clip and be like, this guy could have put his knee in this position or, or whatever it is. It's like, no, look at, look at what they're doing well. And I think like, uh, as kind of cliche as it is, like spreading that positivity throughout the sport will, will be more beneficial, I think. Yeah, 100% that like what we should be like inclusive for people. Like if always being negative, people aren't going to look at ultimate and be like, well, I want to do that. Those guys seem like they're going to be positive impacts in my life. Like, we should be positive and have positive spaces and try to like bring people in and that's what's going to grow the sport and like make people want to play and and like be around ultimate so i try to be as positive as realistic <laughs> in a lot of ways totally and that's a hard balance to, to find right um but yeah you mentioned you're more of like an offensive minded guy uh i've watched a lot of your videos but what's kind of like your your bread and butter when you're going through film like what what makes you think like oh this is this is what i want to break down it depends really my favorite film to look at is like the drone footage from over the top like the full 14 and there's some there's some like good people out there that have like uh that that footage that you can you can find and when i'm looking at that i'm kind of like i think actually aj merriman was talking about this um when you when you talked about like where like not watching the disc like you're not going to gain a lot by, on film by watching what's happening around the disc because you're missing basically the entire game because uh, it's happening in other places. So looking like downfield, looking, I look at like the middle of the stack a lot, like if it's a vert stack, like looking at the middle of the stack, like what is, what is happening there? Um, and then you'll catch a lot of things on the periphery 
Um, so I'm kind of just like looking at those, like how are teams structured? Where are, where are teams attacking space? Um, I watched uh, the chain truck stop game a little bit ago from, from this past year's nationals. And one of the things that I was, I was looking out for there is like, how is truck stop like starting their offense out? Like, you know, what are they doing? Like, where's Rowan at right on the field? Like, how is that happening? Like, where is Christian Boxley at? Like, what is he doing? Um, in, in those situations. So that's what I really like looking at. And then like on Instagram, like looking at highlights, I try to look at like the small things. So like there's like a video uh, where Jack Williams like makes a Jack Williams cut and just like it burns Grant Lindsley. And I think some people are like, that's bad defense. Like you go tell Grant Lindsley that he's playing bad defense. So I'll just, you, you can handle that one. And you know, the, like the thing I noticed there is like he, he takes a second and he like looks directly at Osgar who has the disc. And those are the things that I think don't get said out loud a lot. Like, we'll just say, oh, like, he made a great cut. He was patient. It was like, well, what did he do to, to clue in with Osgar? And, like, how are they communicating subtly on the field? And I like to look for those things a lot, too. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's super cool, like, finding those very, very small details that, that one, or not a lot of people are, are looking at. Um, kind of following along that, that same wave, like, are there any like guidelines you would suggest for people when they're watching film to be able to find some of those things on their own? That's a really good question. Uh, don't be afraid to back up the film 20 times. Like you're not going to catch everything the first time, you know, and there's, there's something to like seeing how quickly you can like read the game and pick it up. Um, but like pause it, back it up five seconds, watch those five seconds, pause it again, back it up 10 rewatch those seconds because that's like if you see something cool happen something something led up to that like if you see a really cool huck coming off after like two or three throws there was something planned there especially off of a pull play that like you can go back and learn and say okay like that was exactly what they were doing that was what they were they were hoping to accomplish and like break it down so i think i posted a, a video yesterday where the empire shared like a it was like a two throw score um, and I, and I watched that video probably like five or six times, um, uh, probably like 10 times before I like even, even like went in and, and did anything with it. Um, and even then, like you can't catch everything on it. You know, it was like a play where, uh, Osgar kind of like makes his own space and then Yacht takes a few steps out and cuts deep, isolated in the stack. But then like, as I, as I watched it more, you know, Jack Williams is doing something really specific of like pushing out and making sure his guy is not in that space where Osgar's wanting to throw the hook. And if you watch, and if you go back and watch it, like his defender jumps up and tries to get that. And any closer, you know, he might have a play on the disc. And then you have, I can't, I, I think it might be Lithio and um, someone else upfield. And they're kind of like splitting out to make different options. So you have this thing that happens with Yacht and Osgar that's really effective. But what, you, what you're not seeing is they had contingencies and you have to go back and see where are those contingencies happening for that offense to go and be effective if that first play doesn't go off. So like watch things, watching things multiple times is how like you learn those things. Yeah, I like that. Uh, speaking on that as well, like I know you were talking a lot about like the, the AUDL there. Um, like what are, what are some of the big kind of differences you see in the, the club game versus the now UFA? I mean, it's just, the UFA is just like so, so offensive minded. Like it's a huge field and there's not a lot defensives can do. Like, ultimate is already an offensive advantage game. Like, if you're if you're an offense and you're perfect through the game, you can't lose. Like, if you're if you never turn the disc over, you can, there's no breaks. You're gonna win the game automatically. Your, your defense doesn't have to do anything. So there's a there's an advantage to the offense there. And the big huge field, the AUDL, just makes it so much easier. Like, there's there's more space to throw into you can um, hit bigger hit bigger angles um, but I think for me like in terms of like UFA versus club I think clubs a better game uh, for that reason like it, it's more variable defensive have a better mm -hmm. better option you have to be a little bit more um, creative in how you and how you attack spaces um, and you have to be a little bit more I think crisp on your throws who knows people have different opinions on it that's my opinion on it um, but I think also the club game worldwide, you know, that's the game that's going to be the world game. You're, I don't think we're going to see 
the AUDL or UFA field size like take over and be whiff diff regulated. Um, I think the size of the ultimate field that was determined all those years ago in a parking lot in Columbia, New Jersey or whatever, um, that's going to be the game as it exists, I think, forever. And I may be wrong, but um, just because it is so much more available, the, the, t the spaces are tighter, you have to do a little bit more, I, I think. And I, I mean, I didn't play much at AUDL, but that was my, that's my take on it. Sure. Uh, and I think that, that makes sense, right? Like, how, how I think about it is, like, I'm, I'm a big basketball guy, sort of related to basketball. Right? If you take, you're playing three on three. If you're playing half court, right, that, that's a really good game. Right? But suddenly, if you go three on three full court, it's like the, the more athletic players just naturally dominate right? because you have way more space. Um, and so I think it's like it, it's not this perfect like scale, but I think it's the smaller the field, the more skill is going to win. The bigger the field, the more athleticism is going to win. And again, it's like it's not saying that skilled players do bad on bad fields or big fields or, or whatever. Right. But like even just to like relate it to myself, like the. Uh, uh, a couple weeks ago, I went to like, Dallas Legion's tryouts, and that was the first time I ever played on a UFA AUDL size field. And I'm a player who, I, like, I'm not crazy athletic, but I definitely rely on my athleticism more than I rely on game IQ. Like, I'm not the, the smartest player on the field. And so when I was cutting on that, that huge field, I was like, this is a breeze. This is crazy. And it's just because it then favors my athleticism over skill. But if you put me on 4x4 mini on a very small field, it's like I'm, I'm going to struggle a little bit because it's like, where do I go? Right? And so... I think like people also kind of understanding that I think is, is super important. Yeah, yeah, and I'm like the complete opposite. I, I'm pretty coordinated. I like to think about myself. I have a good hand-eye coordination, like I always have, but I'm not like, I'm not gonna be your fastest player. I'm not gonna be your strongest player, but I, like how I think I was successful in Ultimate and got to like the level I was able to get at was because like I was gonna be smarter than the next person and my throws were gonna be better. Like that's where I, that's where I kind of like excelled at and like I got like you know I would get I wouldn't get a lot of D's under I wouldn't get a lot of like you know those incredible plays but I get a lot of poach blocks just by like making sure that like my head's always on the swivel and like making sure like I know where the disc is going and if I know the game better I know where you're gonna want to look at and on the AUDL field you can have that but you also have to be athletic and get, and get all the way there but on a on the club field you know the USA ultimate field you can make up more ground quicker on, in that way. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, I, I think that's a good point. Like, again, it's not to say that like you like only have to be athletic on a UF. You can be brain dead and be really good on a UFA field. Like, that's obviously not the case. But it's just like kind of that that sliding scale. I like to think about it. Um, but yeah, along that point of like improving game sense, right? Like improving game IQ, watching film. I assume number one thing, following ulti breakdown, watching all those videos, I assume. Number two thing, but like anything else that, that you would um, recommend for younger players that are trying to improve their, their game sense? Man, the thing that I always did is I always, I asked so many questions. I mean, there were amazing players around me. Like, you know, I, I've, I've mentioned like a ton already. You know, if you're, if you're around those, those good players, just ask them things. Like ask them, you know, if you've seen, if you see them do something, you're like, oh, like, hey, like, can you explain to me like what that, like what you were doing there, what you're thinking, like, you know, ask them about your own game. Like, I think always start with, do you see anything I was doing that was good? And starting with positives, I think, is, is always better than saying, like, going to, like, hey, like, how can I be better? Um, because you're, there's, like, a two-sided part of that. Like, people giving feedback, you always want to start with, like, hey, here are the things you're doing well. Because that's going to make the person more receptive. Asking for feedback and saying, hey, like, what are some of the things that I was doing well? That's going to put that person in, like, a better mind space, like, talk and have a conversation. Um, and just, like, soak that up. And like any, any chance you get, like try to, try to engage and talk with, talk with players who have that experience and, and know what they're looking at. Um, and then just like, like watching as much as possible, looking at different spaces, like pick a, like I always like to tell you know, guys, like watch a game and pick a player, like every time on the field and watch what they're doing. Um, don't look at any other player and just see what's happening and what, and how they're doing. And you're going to pick up like those little small things that, you know, that Christian Boxley does or AJ Merriman or Yacht or, or Jack Williams, you know, or uh, Paul Lally is another guy who I got the pleasure to play with um, and against. And like he's has an amazing career at Rowlers. Uh, you know, watch these guys and see those things that they're doing and, and like 
pick up those pieces of the game, there's a great book, um, The Inner Game of Tennis, um, by Timothy Galway. Um, and the thing he talks about in that is people learn more by watching and repeating and trying to just do those things that they're seeing rather than like strict feedback. That, that people get. Yeah, no, Inner Game of Tennis definitely great, great book. Like, if you haven't checked it out already, definitely, definitely check it out. Um, but yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I listened to Kyle Henke's episode on the Breakside podcast. Shout out Breakside podcast. But yeah, Kyle said, well, there's 14 players on the field, so you could watch a point 14 different times, and it's going to be a different game every single time. Like that, that's huge, right? Um, so yeah, definitely great advice. Real quick, I want to talk about the sponsor of today's episode. They've been the sponsor for a lot of episodes. This is Breakmark Ultimate. They are a jersey apparel company. They were the ones that helped out my team, San Antonio Alamode, uh, the club team I played for this past season uh, with some jerseys, some awesome designs. So if you're a high school team, college team, club team, or just any sort of team looking for some jerseys, I think Breakmark Ultimate is a great option. They're also the ones helping me out with this Tobu Fitness merch. It's the stuff that you see me wearing in pretty much all my videos now. So if you're interested in getting some jerseys or if you're interested in helping out your boy and getting some Tobu Fitness merch, make sure you check out the links down down in the show notes, or you can check out the link in my bio uh, on Instagram if you're looking for some more information. Let's get back to the show. Let's shift gears a little bit here. Um, I know you're really passionate about like youth ultimate. Right? Can you kind of talk about some of your thoughts on that and how it can help the game develop? Yeah, so I, I think my, my passion for youth ultimate comes from like a bunch of different places. So when I, I um, work in education, I studied education. I always wanted to be in those spaces where like I'm working with like kids and like helping them like learn and like be people and like, like basically what education is, is learning how to be a person. Um, you know, so that's like one, one of the passions I have. And then I also have like a passion for ultimate. I want to see the sport grow and be successful and like have like, I want to, I want to keep watching and I want to keep playing. And that is incumbent on other people watching and playing with me. So, you know, there's these models, uh, you know, in other sports, like uh, the NFL has like play 60. Basketball has, um, I can't think of the the tournament structures, the, the youth structures they have, but it's like, it's, you know, huge. Like, you know, you see like these huge, uh, these big teams where the NBA players, kids play on these, these teams and like the youth programs are developed. Soccer has like great youth programs. Um, and that's how these, that's how these sports continue to have, well, one, they have like these huge audiences already because they have time on their side. But that's how they also continue to get players in and interested in the game. And I think that's like an area um, that Ultimate could stand to develop in um, and think about the ways that it's really, it's really well set up to be more than just teaching kids the sport, more than just teaching youth the sport, but also like teaching them like important life skills. So um, the reason, one of the reasons I'm here is uh, I'm, I'm at the South by Southwest EDU conference. Um, and I got the pleasure of going to a session that um, Austin FC was putting on with their a nonprofit branch um, for ATX. And they were talking about, you know, kind of some of the things that they're doing in terms of building social emotional skills for kids and, um, you know, through, through play and through sport. Um, and you know, ultimate's so well set up for that. Like, we don't have referees. We have to have social emotional skills to arbitrate ourselves on the field. And, you know, we have to have the, the, that like skill and knowledge of how to, how to work with one another, how to work within ourselves to know how to navigate those situations. And not only like, is that just important for the sport, but it's important in life. And those are some things that I think um, youth, youth ultimate and like investing in youth can help out with. And then we'll get the added benefit of, okay, well, now these kids are playing ultimate and now, you know, I'm a parent. Parents want their kids to be involved in things because you just want them to be involved in things and you can't always have things for them to do. Um, and so there's a market for it. There's a market for people wanting to pay for sports and pay for things. And, you know, whether we like it or not, the way ultimate's going to grow is by getting investment and monetary investment. That's just the, the world we live in and the market, how it works. So, you know, finding a way to, to do that and invest in kids is, I think, like one of the things that I, like, I'm most passionate about in terms of thinking about the growing concern of Ultimate. You know? Totally. Yeah. And I, I think that's a great point. Like, I've never even thought about how, 
like important spirit of the game would be for a developing kid. Like I come from a basketball background, which is very heavy on like trash talk and just being like, you're stupid. Like when someone makes a bad call. Uh, so yeah, like, and then the, the stark contrast with how like I see ultimate and spirit of the game. Like at first it was a very foreign concept of like, why aren't we trash talking each other more? Uh, but yeah, I, I think from like a development standpoint like that, that would be super, super valuable uh, for a kid as, as they're growing and, and learning how to like, like respectfully disagree with somebody essentially. Um, yeah, as, as far as like things that you would want to see like done more kind of in the youth space or yeah, any kind of like ideas or where you would want to see it in the next like five, 10 years? I think the biggest thing is I, 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 would, I would love to personally see more players involved with growing youth like like an investing in youth you know there's there's hundreds of ultimate teams out there um and i think the the ufa teams are doing a good job um of of investing in teams and there are communities that are doing a really good job i think like north carolina um and the triangle they have an incredible model of investing in youth and just seeing that happening in other places um you know seeing it seeing it happen you know if you have a club team out having a a branch of your team that is devoted to volunteering and being out in the community and like you know maybe it's maybe it's just a clinic and if four people come you know you should view that as a success that's four people who might not have been there otherwise you know um and then you and having that starting point and just investing back your time and effort into the thing that like gave you joy Right. I think, you know, a lot of people get a lot of joy from playing ultimate and spreading that to other people and especially kids, I think, is is something that I would love to see. For sure. And I know one thing we talked about earlier, like places that are doing it really well are like the international places like outside of the U.S., um, like, you know, Singapore, um, Belgium. Like, do you want to kind of talk about your thoughts on like the, the international game? Yeah, so I try to, I try to like one of my big things was another reason why I started the 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 account was to just like see what other things are out there, like see how much I can like learn about how other teams are doing their games, how they're like building up their team structures, what they're thinking about, um, how they're marketing themselves in some sense. And I've noticed, especially in for European teams, the model that they follow is the football, like soccer model. Um, and, you know, where you have these, these teams, you have, I, I'm a big Liverpool fan. Um, so you have, you know, you have the first team uh, and then you also have the second team and you have the U20s and the U18s and the U, U16s and the U15s and on, on down the line. Um, and it's all free to play, right? Like that's, that's another thing that's like, I think, big in the model. So you have the teams in Europe that have copied that model because it's the one that they see, like, the U.S. teams copy, like, the NFL model, right, or, like, the NBA model, where you're always competing with, with another team, um, and it's just different. They, they have that structure. So, moon catchers, I think was the example that I was pointing out. They have, they have moon catchers. They have moon cup. They have indoor team for moon catchers. They have, uh, I, can, I don't know what age, but they have, like, U20 or something like that for moon catchers. And then they have, like, youth programs that they're putting on. Um, there's a team, uh, I think it's RG, RJP out of uh, Poland, I think, and um, they I've I've seen them post a lot of like youth videos and like oh, it's an organizational structure rather than a singular team structure, and you build up and down up and down the ladder and across into different divisions, more so than I, than US teams tend to do. Yeah, for sure, and I think like. Um even just looking at what the coaches are talking about and like the international, um, like, yeah, on international teams, like it's really, um, like it's really impressive. Uh, there's better everyday coaching, I believe his name. Are you so good. Yeah. Familiar with him? Yeah. So good. Ian, is that? Uh, I, I don't know his, I just know his handle. I think it's Ian French. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Where, what team does he coach? He, I, I'm not sure. I, I know he coached Ron Lay, mm-hmm. uh, when they, won the the European championships only because I just also listened to um breaks that podcast where he was talking with Ryan Murphy um I think he did a little bit with Clapham as well um but yeah he's he's incredible and he has he's a sub stack 
uh, that I that I follow. Um, he's he's like his mind and the way he thinks about it is incredible. And they're all like, uh, I'm not sure Ian particularly, but a lot of those guys came from a soccer coaching background, and that's where they're bringing in how they're developing players. Yeah, for sure. Like they're taking these, they they're taking these principles that like aren't. They're, they're, it's nothing revolutionary. It's stuff that's worked for years and years and years. It's just in different sports and now applying it to ultimate, which I think is the, the thing that's missing across the board. Um, like it, we, even with like with my content, right? Like none of the exercises that I show, like I made up, right? Like all that stuff is super super simple stuff. Nothing is specific to ultimate. Even if I say it's specific to ultimate, it looks specific, right? It's all. These are all like general exercise principles that are just, I've just kind of translated into ultimate and that's why they work. And I think that's what the Ian does so well is he takes these coaching philosophies that have obviously worked well for soccer or, or football for, for them across the pond. Um, yeah, that it just works so well for so many people and applying it to ultimate, I think is, is really, really cool. Yeah. And, and, and I, you know, that's like Felix's, uh, from hive, like that's kind of like his, his approach is he's taken like these other principles and applying it, applying its ultimate, and, and it's like incredible. And I think for me, that was a like a revelation. In some sense, is hearing him talk about like I can't remember exactly how he puts it, but had had ultimate developed in Europe, it would have a much more soccer bent. Like it would have been hex already, but we kind of followed this play style, uh, like like set play style for football, you know, or in, in some senses basketball. Um, and it's kind of an awkward sport in that sense, and it's and it, but it's efficient and it works, and you still see like the U.S. being the dominant force and playing that way. But like opening up your mind to like the possibilities of playing differently, as a coach, for for one, helps me like look at the field a little bit better and think about things differently. But then as a player, as I'm playing, I've noticed as I've taken that bend, looking at and and exploring different spaces on the field in ways that I haven't that I hadn't before. And I've been playing for 15, 16 years, going on 16 years at this point in time. And like that simple mind shift of thinking about the game and with different principles has improved my playing, even if I'm not putting those principles into play all the time. For sure. One, one of the ways uh, that I kind of think about it and what I've heard other people talk about is like, I heard a good quote recently um, where was, they said like, irrational thinking is always like listening to authority or the majority. Right? And I think it's exactly that. Like if you just listen to somebody say a bunch of principles and you apply it like 100%, like principle by principle, word for word, like then you will probably have some pushback or you'll see that it doesn't work too well for you. But if you're able to like think critically and be adaptable and like see principles that work and apply them to your game and see like, oh yeah, like these couple things work, maybe these not so much for me and not, not being so rigid but being fluid, like I think you'll see like a ton of success by adopting a bunch of other different things. Cool. Well, as, as we kind of wrap it up here, there's one question that I like to finish all the podcast episodes with. It's my favorite question. Um, I'd like to know what kind of the greatest minds in our sport are pondering, right? Like the example I always give is I want to know what keeps LeBron James up at night thinking about basketball. So for you, Tim, what are kind of the big questions that you're, you're trying to answer, you're pondering right now in regards to Ultimate? Yeah, I think the... And it's not anything like revolutionary. I don't, I don't like consider like myself to have a revolutionary mind. I kind of just like steal things and talk about them in different ways. Um, but I'm, I'm really thinking about phases of play, especially on offense and thinking about kind of what, what it might look like to think about that and break it down into very small bits. So like we have a pull play. We want our pull play to gain 20 yards. And that is... We, we design everything around gaining 20 yards of, of vertical distance. Um, and then once we're, then once we're there, now let's rethink about the game. We've made it 20 yards. Now let's say, okay, well, uh, think, like thinking about like a total football or a mindset or like thinking about how like IX played in their pressing, right? They compressed teams. And then they expanded. So kind of using that mindset of saying, okay, let's get 20 yards. And now we have actually more space to work with because we don't have an end zone right behind us. And we can think about the field in different ways. And now how can we, how can we exploit different spaces from that space? Okay, now we've made it 30 more yards. 
and now we're looking at an end zone. And okay, how are we going to now change the way we're playing right there to be efficient or, you know, be different? So I use a lot of soccer analogies. Um, so like one of the things that I have picked up in my game is walking up the field. And like, so there's a stat on Messi, the, he, a top, across Europe's five league, top five leagues, walked more than any other player. Um, and like, just like thinking, like we'll always think about like getting up field and pressing and pressing and pressing. I have found, especially in league, uh, which is, you know, much different than high level club or, or UFA, that the less I push up the field, oftentimes the more successful our league teams are because I'm not getting in and cramming spaces for newer players who need more space to play. They need a little bit more margin for error. And if you're close to them, you're bringing your, clo your defender close to them. So like thinking about like breaking down and thinking about the game in those different ways um, and utilizing it to, to the advantage. Yeah, I kind of like meandered around the topic, but yeah. No, I think this is all super interesting stuff. Um, well, cool. Uh, Tim, tell people again uh, where they can find you. Uh, you can find me at Ulti Breakdowns on uh, Instagram and YouTube. I'm going to try to post more YouTube videos. I think I have like five up right now, but I actually like that long form content better. But um, yeah, those are, the, those are the two places you can find me. I'm not on X or anywhere else. I don't think I ever will be. Uh, but yeah, thanks awesome. for having me. Yeah, awesome. Thank you for being here. You've been listening to the Tobu Fitness Podcast. Our passion is to be your guide in elevating your game and mastering the art of ultimate frisbee through the lens of strength and conditioning. No hype, just substance. We hope you've enjoyed the show. If you did, make sure to like, rate, and review. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit us up on Instagram and YouTube at Tobu Fitness. And to get info on one-on-one -on -one coaching and training programs, Programs, hit the website at tobufitness.com. Thanks so much for listening and see you next time on the Tobu Fitness Podcast.